Hey everybody, this is Pastor Brad. Thank you for joining us today at Pleasant View First Baptist Church. We are so glad that you were here. If you're new to us, we'd love to know. If we can be a part of your faith journey, we would love to help. And you can connect with us by going to pvfpc.com slash online card. I get all of those in my inbox and nothing makes me any happier. I say this all the time and I mean it. Nothing makes me any happier than to hear from some of y'all out there. Hey, also, if uh, you're watching right now online and you are, are with us this morning, would you just give us a shout out in the comments just to let us know that you're here? That's always a blessing to the staff and myself. Well, I'm coming to you from the foyer here in the church uh, for an important reason. I have got some really, really, really good news for you. The staff and myself met together and the leadership met together this week to look and see where we are with the pandemic situation. And we feel like we have done what we've needed to do to keep our people safe, getting past the holidays and such. And with the numbers beginning to come down and the summer uh, and spring making its way in, we feel like that we can safely come back together. And we're going to try to do that on Sunday, January the 31st. Yes, that's this year in <laughs> just a few weeks. So that's exciting news. Now, there's a lot involved with us in order for us to still keep people safe. And so um, you'll be hearing from us with the details of on what that's going to look like. We're going to ask some things from you in order for us to be able to come back together that quickly, even though we're still in the middle of this pandemic. But we are going to do that. We plan on uh, having Kids View active and Student Ministry active. Life View groups will still be offline for a little while longer. But still Still, hey folks, we get to come back together. That's going to be an exciting time. Cannot wait to be a part of that. Look for emails and texts and, and website updates in the coming days. And I'll talk more next Sunday about exactly what this is going to look like. Bottom line though, coming back together on Sunday, January the 31st. It is going to be a great day. I cannot wait to say to you that day, welcome home. Hey, one last thing before we get into the worship time uh, today. We are having food truck Fridays again here on our church campus, out in our church parking lot. And every Friday night uh, through the end of this month, we have the Chick-fil-A truck back and also driving you donuts uh, truck is there as well. And so hopefully you want to be a part of that every Friday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. The details are on our Facebook page. Well, hey, I don't want to waste any more time. Let's hand things over to Pastor Rob as he leads us in worship this morning. Praise the Lord with me. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves. There is hope in your name, this morning turns to songs of praise. Our God saves, our 
our God saves. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. Yeah, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. I hear the joyful sound of our offering As your saints bow down, as your people sing We will rise with you lifted on your wings And the world will see that our God saves Our God saves There is hope in your name Our God saves, our God saves, our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name. songs of praise our God saves 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 Testament, whenever you see the word Lord, it is actually the Hebrew word Adonai, which is always translated Lord. Other words for God, Elohim and Yahweh are translated God or Lord God or Sovereign God. But we know that the Lord has revealed himself all throughout history and now in this final phase, the church age, Jesus is Lord. So he is Adonai, the one predicted in the Old Testament. So we sing to him this morning, who is like him? Who is like him, the lion and the lamb, seated on the throne? Mountains bow down, every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise Adonai, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise Adonai, all the nations of the earth. All the angels and the saints sing praise. Crown him the king, he, he deserves, deserves our praise. Seated on the throne. Come and bow down, down let us lift our voice to the Lord of hosts. Praise Adonai from the rising of the sun to the end of every day praise adonai all the nations of the earth all the angels and the saints sing praise singing praise adonai from the rising of the sun to the end of every day, praise Adonai. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise Adonai. From the rising of the sun to the end of every day, praise Adonai. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. Praise the Lord. Praise Adonai.
There shall be showers of bless. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops around us our fall. For the showers we bleed There shall be showers of blessing Precious reviving again Over the hills and the valleys Sounds of abundance of rain Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops around us are falling, but for the showers we bleed. Now if we were in an African American church, it might sound a little more like this. There shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us, so Lord. Let them feel now a refreshing, come now and honor thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy does round the suffering, but for the showers we bleed. There shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing. Now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us of falling. But for the showers we bleed. We know mercy jumps around the sorrowing, but for the showers we bleed. Well, we know that we as Christians already are blessed some to greater measure, some to lesser, but we all are the recipients of those spiritual blessings that we learn about in Ephesians 1. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places has been given to us in Christ. We also know that we inherit the blessing of Abraham according to the promise, the one that was given to him way back and passed on through his original chosen people, the Jews, who are still chosen in their way. But uh, Aaron, the brother of Moses, gave a famous blessing that has been put into song for these days. Receive it this morning because it's still in force, the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn face toward you and give you peace sing it together the lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give Amen, 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 Amen. 
the Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Amen 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 May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you, and within you, He is with you, He is with you. May His presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you, He is with you, He is with you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, in your weeping, and rejoicing, He is for you. He is for you, 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 sing it Amen. 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 favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're sleeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you Amen. 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 Singing. Amen. 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 Pastor Brad joining you once again from my office. We are still having a few technical difficulties with our equipment in the sanctuary, which we will have fixed shortly. But until then, it's just easier uh, with the equipment we are using to do this from my office in regards to sounds and such. I don't feel as comfortable uh, in here as I do standing behind a pulpit in the sanctuary. However, uh, you do what you have to when you have to. So I'm happy to come from my office this morning with the message and thank you for your understanding in regards to that well hey you know um i started preaching a series a while back called the in-between years a look at the church in the book of acts 
And uh, I was well into that series on October the 25th. That was the last time I preached from this series. And then we moved in the whole month of November to our uh, One Fund Emphasis, where we uh, took up, praise God, over $11,000 for missions. And every single Sunday in that month, we focused on that. And that was a great time. First time we ever did that. And then right after that, we rolled into the Christmas season. And I felt led to lead a couple of messages related to Christmas. Uh, and then Pastor Noah preached, and then I preached a special message relating to what was happening around us last week, and today we are back in our Acts study, the in-between years, a look at the church in the book of Acts. And so I'm excited to get back going again, so let's pray, and we'll do that. Father, thank you so much for Pastor Rob and the worship time that he led us in. I pray it prepared our hearts. I pray maybe that the worship time helped us to empty ourselves, like I talked about last week, Father, that it would, 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 we would empty ourselves and come before you, Father, with open hearts and allow you to fill us with whatever it is you want to show us this morning. And I pray I'd have an empty heart too, Lord. Help me, Father, to be used by you. Get me out of the way so that I can share your word today. And this would just build us up. It would convict us. It would change us. I know that your spirit can move through us, Father God, whether we're together or apart. And God, I just want to thank you for this time that we've been a part of. I know that may sound crazy to those that are listening to me pray to you right now, but Lord, one of the things that has shown me is just how precious our being able to be together is. And uh, it's helped me to appreciate that much more. And forgive me for taking that for granted. And Father, so as we come back together in just a few days, Lord, I pray that it would be more precious to me and all of us than ever. Father, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, you know, if you know me, you know I am a massive Lord of the Rings fan. I uh, love the book. I love the movies even more. And um, you also know that, in my opinion, the Lord of the Rings movies by Peter Jackson are the all-time best movies ever made, hands down, even better than Titanic. And, and yes, maybe to some of your shock, even better than um, the Avengers movies, and so uh, the Endgame uh, Avengers movie, which was also very popular. And you know what? You don't have to agree with me. Everybody has a right to be wrong about that, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> All-time best movies ever made, and I remember watching the first installment of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, you know, it was three hours plus, uh, and then after I watched it, I thought to myself, did I just watch one movie or three? Because even though it was long, which that alone can make it feel like more than one movie, it was so packed full of action and story, there was no way I just watched one movie all at one time. But sure enough, yeah, it was just one movie. You know, Acts 3 and 4 is like that. It's so full of action and story, you have a hard time believing it's just two chapters in Luke's second volume. You know, it started with Peter and John healing a man born lame in the temple court. And then them being taken before the council of religious leaders for doing that. It caused such a ruckus. Everybody got all uh, fired up about it. And so they had to call them in and examine them. And then while they're before that religious uh, council, uh, Peter preaches a powerful message proclaiming Jesus, the risen Jesus. And then that council commanded them not to preach Jesus' name, which is the first instance of persecution in the church and much more to come. And then Peter and John saying, nope. We are going to preach Jesus no matter what you say. And then you have the church after that, them being released, praying for boldness to preach even harder. And then finally, today, after a break from the series, we return to our Acts study where we're going to finish chapter 4 with another snapshot of the early church, like the one we saw in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. Maybe you remember this, one of my favorite messages I've ever preached. Acts 2, 42 to 47, this little snapshot Luke gives us, the first one, says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It's one of those snapshots. And man, when you read that, you just kind of have to step back a minute and savor that. What a tremendous, tremendous testimony to the heart and soul and spirit of the early church. 
you know, we don't need to take these snapshots lightly. We need to let them convict and encourage us. Convict us in how it should be and encourage us in how it can be. Probably right now in our country more than ever at a time, it seems the church has lost its way. These snapshots can really kind of write us. They can really kind of uh, convict us and bring us to where we need to be. We need to be. So that was the first snapshot we'd already looked at. So here's the second one, which rounds out chapter four and all the stuff that happened in chapters three and four. That's a fitting end to that, I think. Here's the second snapshot, uh, and it's very similar to the first if you pay close attention. This is Acts four, beginning in verse thirty-two. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of, native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's the end of chapter 4. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Just these few verses, as all of God's Word, but this especially, is just so rich. And we can draw so many truths from this text, but for today I'm just going to pull out three. And it's all I've got, probably all I've got time for. A couple of things we noticed in this text that really stand out. First, as with the first snapshot, we note their incredible unity. We note their incredible unity. Now, the, verse 32, the first part. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Wasn't just some of them. Wasn't just most of them. It was all of them. The full number of those who believe were of one heart and soul. Heart and soul. <laughs> you know, these days, heart and soul has to do with the love ballads and romantic movies uh, more than anything else. It describes idyllic relationships between couples. Two people joined together, heart and soul, so much so they are almost one person. Two people who desperately love each other. Two people who want what's best for each other, who put the other uh, first to a fault. And I think there's a whole categories of movies, maybe on Netflix and others, that, uh, that, that, that have to do with that idea. Heart and soul was also a modern idiom expressing the idea of giving oneself over wholly and completely to something, putting all the effort you can into something, investing the whole of one's obsession and passion and energy into something. And you know what? All those things convey the idea uh, uh, here Except this is a group of people, a community of people bound together through Christ that have this kind of spirit and this kind of attitude. You ever thought about church like that? A group of people so unified, so bound together, they are of one heart and soul. A group of people so unified that they're, they're joined together, they're almost like one person, even though it's an entire group. Uh, a group of people that desperately love each other. A group of people who want what's best for each other and put everybody else's interest uh, before their own to a fault. A group of people that give themselves wholly and completely over to something. A group of people who put all their effort they can into something. A group of people who invest all of their obsessions and passions and energy into being part of the community of faith. Paul called the Christians in Philippi to live like this. Philippians 2, 1 through 4. He says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. What he's saying there to them is, I want you to live out as brothers and sisters in Christ with heart and soul. Be unified in heart and soul. He said basically the same things to the Christians in Ephesus. Ephesians 4, 1 through 4. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. He's talking there about being a community of faith that is bound together, heart and soul. And you know, as I kind of mentioned before, this is something that the church in America today really needs to hear. I don't think the church as a whole in our country is anywhere close to exhibiting this. If anything, it's probably the opposite. So this really speaks to us, but it speaks to our church right now individually as well, because even our church, as healthy and unified as it is, and we are folks, we fall short here. Luke's snapshot convicts us in how it should be, but it encourages, encourages us in how it can be. We can have this too if we seek it and if we live for it. And, you know, I think that's something we should pray for. It'd be a great kind of an action point for today's message is, is let's pray that we would be a local community of faith bound together in heart and soul, unified heart and soul. And I hope you'll join me in praying for that for our church. Well, what comes next flows out of what we see before it. With their incredible unity of heart and soul comes, now you're ready for this one. This is kind of hard unrestrained generosity unrestrained generosity verse 32 the second part and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own but they had everything in common you know over and over the bible teaches us that the true test of where we are spiritually the true test of where our loyalties lie a trusty indicator of our righteousness is found in what we do with our possessions what we do with money wealth. Now, this was a major theme of Jesus' teachings, and you don't have to search very hard to find it. Perhaps the most striking is what he said in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. He says to his people, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And then there's this meeting between Jesus and a rich man in what can only be described as an illustration of Matthew 6, 24. It's in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. And as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And he said to him, Well, you just lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, Jesus wasn't trying to get this wealthy young man to support his ministry. He wasn't. He was trying to show him where his affections were focused, that he didn't understand what Jesus was really offering with eternal life, that he couldn't serve two masters, one of them being Jesus and the other being the money that he loved so much. And this does not, as some fear, promote the need for giving up all your possessions in order to be saved or see it as a command that we follow today. One commentator points out that God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, which was, in a way, everything he had, but said, wait, don't do that when he, when he saw that he was going to obey. And most likely, Jesus would have done the same with this man's money. He didn't want his money. He wanted his heart. And if he had been willing to give away his money, he would have known he had his heart. See, having money isn't the problem, it's having you is. Which brings us to the early church in our snapshot. Their unrestrained generosity wasn't something they were compelled to do. It wasn't a way for them to be religious. They weren't thinking, well, if we want to serve God and make him happy, well, doggone it, I'm going to have to give away everything I have to do it. No, it wasn't like that. It was the natural outflow of their love for Jesus and each other. You know, the best thing that, that really ever happened to me was when my first child was born and it just got better and better after that. And then now my granddaughter ran. You know, I, I love my children and now my granddaughter. I love them with my heart 
in my soul. And you know one of the things that makes me happier than anything else in this world is to give something to them. Um, giving something to them, if I have anything to give them, is a privilege. It is a joy. And you know, I know with Abby, my first, it started out kind of small, but when she was really little it, it, and was able to eat off of my plate, it was a, a, a ritual daily. When I had something on my plate, she would come and hop in my lap and I would share it with her. And I can't tell you how happy that made me. And as she's gotten older, and certainly all the other ones have gotten older, you know, I've been able to give them different things depending on where they are in their life. And it just, it makes me so happy to do that. There is nothing that I have that's really my own. If I could benefit them with it, I'm going to give it to them. And you know, that's kind of how it was with the early church. They were bound together so much in heart and soul. They loved each other so much that nothing was really their own. They gave it to any as if they had need. And see, here's the thing. Even our church, as healthy and unified and generous as it is, it falls short here also. Luke's snapshot convicts us in how it should be, but it encourages us in how it can be. Folks, the same Holy Spirit who empowered them to enjoy this is the same Holy Spirit that empowers us today. And here's something else. We should pray for this too. Join me in praying that we would love each other so much and love Jesus so much that we would be just given over to a radical generosity in our lives and not consider anything we own. Now, that's a scary prayer. And some of you might say, now, Pastor, I like it when you preach, but now you're meddling. I get it. It convicts me more than it does you all. You have no idea. I would love to tell you I got all this stuff down. I don't. What you don't realize so often is when I preach these messages, I'm the one that's getting hit squarely between the eyes. I'm the one that's being impacted more than you are. Well, next we find their unshakable testimony to a risen Jesus. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, this is super important. Way more important than we might think at first glance. You've probably heard me say often and even very recently, I think it's probably as, as early as last Sunday, <laughs> Uh, how for years I thought the gospel, the point of the Bible, was to get people saved. Can you finish for me? Finish it for me. Get people saved so they could go to heaven when they died. And how the goal and mission of many churches is to take as many people to heaven as they can. That's their motto. And when you hear that, it sounds spot on. It sounds very spiritual. It sounds right. And it's not that it's wrong. But it's just in the last few years, God has shown me how that misses the mark of the grander, more glorious, bigger picture of what he's up to, what we see here uh, in this verse. The early church, the first disciples, pictured in this snapshot, were about giving testimony to the Lord's resurrection. That's what they were about in that bigger picture. Their whole way of thinking and living and breathing looked forward to the day Jesus would return to raise them up in their new resurrection bodies, which would be just like his resurrection body, physical bodies. And then he would redeem the earth at that time. He's going to remake all this over again, free from corruption and sin. And he's going to set up his new kingdom on this literal physical earth where heaven and earth would be bound together once again, just like it was in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And this wasn't something they hoped for one day. It wasn't something they just gave lip service to. It was something that influenced how they lived in that moment. They were citizens of a coming kingdom before any earthly kingdom. They were citizens of a coming kingdom before anything else. A kingdom ruled by King Jesus, the risen King Jesus. So they were compelled to live like citizens of that kingdom in the here and now. That's the part we miss. That's the part I missed. And I'm just now figuring this out. I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't quite figured out what to do about that yet. I'm struggling with that. But I'm hoping God will show me how I can live that out like they did. You know, this idea is the heart of this series, the in-between years, a look at the church in the book of Acts. 
we see very clearly that the early church was not just about getting saved so they could, so they could go to heaven when they died, just passively biding the time in between Jesus' first coming and his second. They were about actively influencing each other and the world around them for Christ. They were about working to make this world like it's going to be one day when Jesus returns, a world where injustice and racism and poverty and suffering are no more. Something that will be marked by the coming resurrection. That's the part we miss. That's the part I missed for so long. Now, think about this. If you have that coming eternal kingdom to look forward to, with all of its treasures and blessings, what need do you have to call anything your own in this world? You see how it connects? One scholar writes, what do you do? What you do with money and possessions declares loudly what sort of community you are. And the statement made by the early church's practice was clear and definite. No wonder they were able to give such powerful testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. They were demonstrating that it was a reality in ways that many Christians today who even sadly balk at even giving a tithe of their income to the church can only dream of. Let me read that again. They were demonstrating that it was a reality in ways that many Christians today, who often sadly balk at even giving a tithe of their income to the church, can only dream of. I'll just leave that there. You know, even our church, as healthy and unified and as, as, as generous as it is, falls short to giving a testimony to the risen Lord like that. And again, Luke's snapshot convicts us in how it should be but it also encourages us in how it can be. You know, we should pray for that too. <laughs> Back to verse 33 though. It says, and great grace was upon them all. And the word for grace uh, here is found many times throughout the New Testament. It's charis. One Bible scholar understands charis here in a threefold way. The favor of the people, God's grace, and the effect of the Holy Spirit. I'd say amen to that. When Jesus' followers live in unity, practice generosity, and are led to give testimony to a risen Lord, an atmosphere of grace, of favor, comes upon them and everyone around them. That grace is within and without. And it is so powerfully energized by the Spirit, it can transform people and cultures and countries. I'm not exaggerating by uh, saying that, folks. That's exactly what happened with the early church. I've talked about this a lot. Christians, for the first few hundred years especially, turned the civilized world upside down. Christianity spread throughout the pagan Roman Empire like wildfire. And to this day, the secular world, the non-Christian world, cannot understand how that happened. We do. We know it was the power of the Spirit. And this happened all because of how they lived in unity, practiced generosity, and gave testimony to a risen Lord. One of my favorite pastors gives two striking examples of how this happened. Listen to what he says. And this would be later on, still the early church, but, but the, the, the church in the first few hundred years after this. He says, in the year A.D. 252, there was a tremendous plague in the city of Carthage. One of the more interesting stories to come down to us from that day was that in Carthage during that plague, the healthy people were leaving the city in droves. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> they had a pandemic. They had to get out because of the threat of contamination and losing everything they had. In the middle of that panic, the great Christian leader Cyprian drew together all the Christians in the center of that town. That town had persecuted and hurt the Christians. Cyprian said, If we're going to do what Jesus did, who though he was rich became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich, then I call you now to fan out through this town and give both personal and financial aid and care and comfort to all according to their need. Not whether they're Christians or not. Not even whether they are your enemies or not. We're called here to follow what our master did. And Keller, Tim Keller is the one I'm quoting here. It's a fascinating story, he says. They would not abandon the city in the midst of the plague. He goes on to say one of the early Roman emperors, Julian, who tried to stem the tide of Christianity and revive the pagan religion, couldn't do it. In his disgust, he wrote one of his friends to talk about why the Christians were succeeding and why they were spreading. Listen to this. He says in a letter that's come down to us, and this is this, is, uh, this uh, Roman emperor, ancient Roman emperor. This is what he wrote. The Christian success lies in their charity, or their, their giving, to all. They take care of not only their own poor, but ours as well. 
Proof positive, Keller says, that one of the main things uh, that differentiated Christians from everybody else was the way in which they used and their attitude toward their money. It was one of the main things that gave the Christian success in a world that really looked at them as very, very odd and strange. By the way, um, that's a good word by him, and this is something uh, another pastor uh, that's a student of his quoted. I'm sure he got that from Keller here. That's one of the things that I've been struck by, um, and it's this. If you're truly a Christian following Christ, if you're truly living for Jesus, there is nobody on any side of anything that will be able to figure you out. If you're truly living for Jesus, everybody in the world will wonder, wait a minute, you act like that. Maybe you're on this side, but then you did this. They're never going to be able to figure you out because no one could ever figure Jesus out. Your allegiance is to Christ and the kingdom of God above all. And if that's the way it is, the world's going to find you odd and strange. They're not going to be able to put you into a particular hole or slot or label you in a particular way. Back to what Keller says. It's one of the main things that gave the Christian success in the world that really looked at them as very odd and strange. This, this generosity was one of the things that gave them their power. It was one of the things that befuddled the world and changed their attitude toward them. And Keller asked, how are we doing on that? The question that comes up, of course, why were Christians so different? Well, the answer is an experience of God's grace. That's how they were to be so different, able to be so different. You know, I said we were going to finish out the chapter, and um, I need to, to wrap this up. So let's close with the final verses where we see that, that grace, that favor demonstrated in a big way. Acts chapter 4, finishing out, beginning in verse 34. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means a son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This spirit of unrestrained generosity and grace that came about from their unity and the testimony of the Lord Jesus impacted a man of some means named Joseph who came to bear the nickname given to him by his fellow Christians, Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was so impacted by all of this, he sold some of his property to support the ministry of the church in Jerusalem. And so Luke tells us that for a couple of reasons. One, to give a, a solid example of someone who would become a leader and kind of a hero in the early church and how that all kind of began, but also to set us up for what's about to come. See, I wish this was the end of the story, but it isn't. Here you have this beautiful snapshot of the church and how pure and sweet and uh, gentle and kind and innocent it is. But when we come back together to look at the next chapter, we are going to see that the church wasn't perfect. We're going to see that things uh, were difficult um, in similar ways that they are today. And this too will be convicting and encouraging at the same time. And we'll look at that next time. But as we close, I have a question for you. Have you ever experienced God's grace? You know, God's grace is so full and it is so free and it is so life-changing that people, when they get uh, uh, exposed to it, when it fills their life, they do crazy things like give away what they have or run into the middle of a, of a, of a plague. Uh, it, it, it's, it's life changing. It's transforming. And not that God would ask you to do any of those things today. He might, but, but not in our situation. But, but still, it's transformative. You know, God wants to include you in his kingdom plans. These kingdom plans that, that the early church was focused on and that we should be focused on today. He wants you to be part of his forever family. He wants to save you not just so you can go to heaven when you die, though that's a wonderful blessing and benefit of it, but so that you can know his love and mercy right now so you can influence this world for him and have purpose and meaning right now that will carry over into eternity. And the way you get in on that is very simple. I talk about it every Sunday as I close a message. Romans 10, 13, Paul writes, quoting an Old Testament prophet, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you haven't done that, would you do that today? You don't have to worry about the words that you say. You don't have to worry about 
uh, coming down an aisle or being in a certain church or singing a certain song. You simply just come to him openly and honestly. You come to God through Jesus and just call on him. And by faith, believe that he'll keep his promise to save you if you call him. And if you do that, would you let us know? Uh, would you go to that online card? The, 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 the link there is below and let us know so we can be a part of your faith journey. And you can do all that while I pray. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you so much in how it convicts us, Lord. But thank you also in how it encourages us. I pray, Lord, that we would be a fellowship of Christians like that. Especially now when things seem so dark in our country. Especially now, Father, when the church has been drugged into so many difficult and uh, terrible things. And I pray we would bring it back out by living these things out in our lives, Lord, and just glorifying you. I pray, Father God, we would be known for our incredible unity. I pray that we would be known for our radical generosity. I pray that we would be known, Father God, for how we give testimony to a risen Jesus. And I pray as a result of that for our church, God, that, that just great grace and favor would be upon us, Lord. And that many people would be saved, but also that we would influence this world for you in a lasting way. Love you, Father. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, love you guys. God bless you all. I'll see you next time.